Hey, Divergent Church, it's so good to be able to join you as we open up the scriptures as part of worship today. My name is Hamish Thompson. I have the, the privilege of being the lead pastor at Abundant Life Church in Wellington, New Zealand. And, and it's so good to be able to, to spend time with you in this way because even though you don't know me and I don't know most of you, I have been getting to know you a little uh, through Josh and Angie and through Cade. And, and if I lived in Canberra, I would worship with you guys. I, I love the vision. I love the heart of, of the church. But, you know, I love the DNA that you guys carry. You know, every time I talk with Josh and Angie and, and with Cade, something just leaps up inside of me. In many ways, our churches are very similar. And it's it's the DNA that really draws me to you guys with your, your connection with one another, your emphasis on the Great Commission, on doing life together, on, on building community. And, and it just reminds me that, that no matter where we find ourselves, that, that we're church, we're family together. You know, even though we're separated by distance, we're not separated by the blood and the spirit uh, that binds us together. So, uh, so I'm, I'm privileged to be able to open up the scriptures to, to encourage you, hopefully, to, to share uh, some thoughts as we continue to unpack this series on the Holy Spirit. You know, I don't know about you, but as I've been watching with you over the last uh, uh, few weeks, I've been challenged, I've been inspired, uh, I've been encouraged and strengthened in, in my own faith and in my own hope uh, and in my own passion for more of the Holy Spirit. I, I don't think we can ever have too much of Holy Spirit in our life. And, and, and last week, you know, Josh just so eloquently and just so persuasively just took us through the scriptures to, to help us understand uh, why we need to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, you know, and he made a, a really great point that, that if Jesus needed to be filled with the Holy Spirit in order to fulfill his, his commission to, uh, to bring release for the captives and recovery of sight to those who had lost sight, or were denied sight of who they really are, who they're created and called to be, then aren't you and I even in more need of that? Don't you and I need more of the Holy Spirit? If Jesus needed him and he is God, how much more do you and I need him? I was really challenged by that because it can be, we can get so complacent, can't we? You know, and, and in a series, in a sense, sorry, I, I just want to follow on uh, from something that Josh said last week, which really I underlined and wrote down. It, it, sits, it, it sits on a note uh, on one of my computer screens in one of my offices uh, where, where he talked about how, how to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit, was to be so in tune with the Holy Spirit that it's like the, the supernatural becomes natural. That which was, which was different, that which was foreign, that which was weird almost becomes natural to us as we lean into the gifts of the Holy Spirit and, and learn how to use these to achieve the mission to which God has called you and I to bring his kingdom to bear in this generation. You know, as I was been thinking about that and, and thinking about, uh, about the, the topic that uh, Josh had asked me to sort of uh, encourage you with, I couldn't help but think of, of a passage in Revelation where, where this whole thing of being so in tune with the Holy Spirit that the supernatural becomes natural uh, is just brought into sharp relief for us. You know, we, we read in, in Revelation, John is, is get, gathered there, it's in the chapter one of the book of Revelation, and it said it was the Lord's day, and, and this is John speaking, I was worshipping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. When I turned to see who was speaking to me, I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. And his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice thundered like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came out from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. You see, here's, here's, here's the thing. Imagine that you were worshipping with, with John. 
Imagine that he was sitting next to you, uh, where, right where you are now, and you're worshipping God. Take a moment and imagine this. He's, he's on the couch next to you. And whatever is in front of you, the, a screen, a, a monitor, a TV, uh, whatever it is, pictures on the wall, whatever's in front of you, you're both looking at it as you pray, as you worship God. And then John gets in the spirit and, and he begins to see the glory of God. He began to see the Lord uh, with feet like bronze and his eyes uh, as though they were burnt with fire. And he begins to, to see thrones and angels and, and the altar of God. And my point is this, you're standing beside him only to see what he sees, to shift the vision from what's in front of you to be able to see what he was seeing requires that you be where he was in the spirit. You see, unless you're in the spirit, you are walking by sight. You see what everyone else sees. But when you are in the spirit, you begin to see the kingdom of heaven and all its brilliance. You begin to see the kingdom of God and, and, the, and, and the plans of God and, and everything like that in ways that other people don't. In other words, the supernatural has become natural. That which you are unaccustomed to, you are now accustomed to. And you begin to live out of that reality rather than the reality that you are experiencing right now. And I say that because I know this may sound a little bit crazy to you, but, but that's where we belong. That's our natural environment and the supernatural in the spirit. In Galatians, Paul says that since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. Not just some part, every part. The assumption that Paul's making here is that, that we are living in the Spirit, that we are following in the Holy Spirit in every part of our life. That it's not a casual thing. It's not a, a random thing. It's not an experience that, that we look back upon. Although we, we certainly should look back at some of those uh, mountaintop experiences, so to speak. But, but the assumption that Paul's making is that, that we are living in fellowship with the Holy Spirit in such a way that that which we would call supernatural is now natural for us. And in saying that, I just want to encourage you, if you are, if you are watching this and and you're on a journey of discovery, you're still processing what part Jesus might have in your life. You're looking for more and you're wanting hope and you're looking for purpose and meaning. I want to I challenge you with this thought. As good as life can ever be, it is nothing compared to what God has for you. There's a dimension to life that, that you cannot access outside of a relationship with Jesus. You cannot access everything that the scriptures hold out to us outside of a relationship with Jesus. And, and you can't access it without the Holy Spirit at work in your life. That's why you, you need the Holy Spirit at work in your life. Now, in saying all that, I'm not saying that, that we should walk around um, seeing angels, or let me put it, rephrase it. I'm not saying if you don't um, see angels, you're walking around your daily life and you're not seeing angels, you're not hearing things from heaven, you're, you're not experiencing any of that, that you're not spiritual. What I am saying is this, that to experience the works of the Holy Spirit, to experience the things that John experienced, to experience the life that Jesus wants you to have, you need to walk in the Holy Spirit. You need to be full of the Holy Spirit. You see, healing, deliverance, miracles, signs and wonders, you know, some of the greater works that Jesus said that we would do in his name. All of these come from the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of this world. They all flow out of our relationship with Jesus, empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, you can't see what John saw. You can't do what the disciples did, unless you stand where they stood, full of the Holy Spirit. And that means that the kingdom of God, God's present, and what flows from that has to become more important to you 
than the realm of sight. The, the kingdom of heaven, the realm of, of, of the supernatural, has to become more important to you than the realm of sight, that which you are familiar with, that which you see. And I say that because we talk a lot about the kingdom of heaven. You know, we, we preach about it, you hear about it in church, you read it in the scriptures, we sing about it, and we accept the principle of the kingdom of heaven. But here's the thing, a principle is not enough. Principles don't heal the sick. Principles won't set captives free. Principles are important. Don't get me wrong. I, I believe in, in, in principles. They're, they're the foundations upon which we stand, upon which we build uh, that which undergirds our faith. But you can know all of the truth about healing and yet never see anybody healed. You can know all, all about salvation and yet still miss heaven. You see, in and of themselves, principles are great, but they're not sufficient to live the life, to experience what God has for us, to bring his kingdom to bear and to fulfill the Great Commission. In Acts chapter 1, Jesus says that you'll receive power, not principles, not understanding, not knowledge, but power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you so that we can be his witnesses telling people about him everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria and to the outermost ends of the earth. It's important to note when we receive power, not just principles. And why? Well, Paul puts it like this. The kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. In other words, it's not just about principles. It's not just about understanding. It is living by God's power. In other words, the kingdom of heaven to which we're called and to which we are supposed to live out of is not about what we say and what we do. It's how we live by God's power, by that supernatural empowering of the Holy Spirit, of being so in tune with the Holy Spirit and what he wants to do in our life that we begin to see life from his perspective, for, through the lens of faith. And, and that's why I, I say that the supernatural has to become more important to us than the realm of sight. That, that the supernatural has to become our naturally preferred environment. That's why I was so encouraged and, and so inspired by, by, by what Josh had to say last week, because it's so true. Because it's only as we are in tune with the Holy Spirit that that, that happens. And, and because we're called to live out of this, because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, is not about talk, it is about living by God's power. That's why the Holy Spirit gives us gifts, gives us tools, if you will, um, in order to, to live out of that, to bring God's kingdom to bear, to continue the work that Jesus has called us to. And that's why we should des desire spiritual gifts. That's why we should desire the tools that God has for us because what they do is they allow us to pull back the, the cover of darkness that, that env envelops people's lives, that dulls their hearing to, to the Spirit of God, that dulls their sight to the kingdom of heaven, that dulls their sensitivity um, to the grandeur and to the glory of God and the plans and the purposes that he has for them, and, and, and dulls them to the point that they will settle for less than they were created for. And, and the, Spirit, the Spirit of God wants us to, to unmask, to, to unveil, to pull back the cover over people's lives so they, can, they, they get a glimpse of, of heaven. Because it's not just about talk. It's about power. You know, a few couple of years ago, I, I was walking down the main street of our city. Our church is in the, in the, in the CBD of, of Wellington City. And I was just taking a walk down, down the street one day, down, down our main street, Lambton Key, just to get some fresh air and just to clear my head. And, and I was just praying and I just felt the Holy Spirit just prompt me to, to go into a particular building. And, and, and so I go into this building, and it's, a, there's, it's an office building, and, and I had no idea uh, what I was doing, but I, I hit the lift button, and I, I jumped in the lift, and, and I just pressed the button, and, and it opened up, and I just felt the Lord say, yes, this is the one. And, and I went up to, 
uh, to the reception desk and, and the lady just looked up from her screen and she said, you know, can I help you? And I said, well, look, this may sound kind of random and, and I don't mean to offend you in any way, but, you know, I'm a, I'm a pastor of a church and I was just walking along and I, I just felt that God wanted me to encourage you. I don't know what's going on in your life right now, but... God wants you to know that he loves you, that, that, that you are a delight to him, that you're not a disappointment to him, and, and that he cares about you. And, um, you know, she just, her, her whole face just, just changed, her demeanor changed. And, and I thought, oh my gosh, I, I, what have I done? And, and she said, just a moment. And she came out from behind her desk and she drew me aside. And, and, and long story short, we, we had, a, had a brief conversation what had happened was this, that um, her boyfriend of several years had broken up with her the night before, and she'd come into office to, to put her, uh, her, her affairs in order, so to speak, and, and she determined that this was going to be her last day on earth. He, but she'd believed a lie of the enemy, that she was worthless, that she was, that she was nothing, that, that, that her life was over, and she was being rejected because she was less than desirable. And so you can imagine when, when God shows up and says to her, you know, you don't know me, but I know you. And I love you and I care for you and, and all the things that I, I shared with her. Well, she may have lost a boyfriend, but she got a new one called Jesus. Because God pulled back the cover that through the Holy Spirit, the gifts, the cover of darkness was pulled back so she could hear something that her, she had been dulled to because of, because of the spiritual work of our enemy, the devil. And, and I just simply say that because the gifts of God are simply for that purpose, to be, to, to be a witness to, to, the, to the grace, to the grandeur to, of Jesus, to the hope that he brings us through reconciliation, through the forgiveness of sin that unlocks spiritual, emotional, physical healing that restores to us over the rest of our lifetime the, the grandeur of the image of the one who holds all things in the palm of his hand. And that's why you should desire the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Not necessarily to, to go in, into a random office, but to be part of God's plan to bring people to himself. To be part of God's plan of, of pulling back the covers and exposing the lies of the enemy so that we can set captives free, so that we can demonstrate the power of God's, uh, the power of God's kingdom to show that he is the great I am through the way that he does things and by the way in which he engages with people. That's why you need to desire these things. In fact, let me ask you a question. If you believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by him, if you believe in the reality of heaven and the finality of hell, unless you are already doing the greater things that Jesus told us we would do in John 14, or unless you are already seeing miracles on a regular basis, or unless you are seeing more fruit in your ministry than Paul and those disciples, why wouldn't you want more of the Holy Spirit? Why wouldn't you desire the tools, the gifts that he freely and graciously and generously gives in order to help us be more effective at bringing his kingdom of grace to bear, of calling people out of darkness into light, of, of speaking hope and life, of setting people alight with a purpose that trans anything that this world could give. Why wouldn't you desire that? And this is, this is really what, what, what I wanted to encourage you with this morning. You see, the tools are meant to be used to empower us to be a witness to Jesus, to demonstrate the power of God's kingdom here on earth, to show that our faith is not simply something that we take hold of as a get out of jail free when I die card. It's not like we come to Jesus and then when we die, we stand at the, the gates of heaven and, and, and there's St. Peter with his long beard and his book and he opens it up and... and uh, you don't have to go, oh, look, my name's there. I said that prayer way back in April 6, 1987. 
It's not like that. Our faith is to be lived now, to be experienced now. And the tools are to allow us to stop living for ourselves and start living for others. Because even though we've never met, here's what I know about you. You came to faith not because you fell in love with Jesus, but because somebody introduced you. Somebody cared enough about you to go out of their way to introduce you to him. Now, that could have been taking you to a church service. It could have been um, opening up the scriptures to you. It could have been any number of ways. But somebody brought you to Jesus. And now it's your turn to bring others. And the tools are simply means to help us do that, to show the power of God's kingdom here on earth, that the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is as powerful now as he was then that he's not bound by time and history, that he's not limited by by science and, 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 and philosophy, that he is the great I am before all things and in whom all things hold together. So let, let, me, let me just quickly outline those tools that he wants you to use, not because these tools rightly used will, will be very effective. You will be able to to see with your own eyes the outworking of God's kingdom. You know, we read scripture and we look at people like Paul and we look at people like Peter and and we look at the miracles that they did and we think, oh, wow. And we have this, this, this longing where we just, romantic longing where we look back and think of only. You know, what if God intended for their experience to be yours? What if God wanted to work through you to do the things that he did through Paul, that he did through Peter, that he did through James? What if if God wants to use you to set captives free, to release people from the bondage of sin through the knowledge of, of, of the cross, to bring healing into their life? You see, I believe he does. And these tools are the means by which God enables us to be more effective than we are because the kingdom of God, setting people free, is not just about talk. It's about power. So let me just quickly outline that list. He says, to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. We, we would often call this uh, you know, the, the spiritual gift of wisdom. To another, the same Spirit gives a message of special knowledge. This is what you probably know as a word of knowledge. The same Spirit gives great faith to another, and to someone else, the Spirit gives the gift of healing. He gives one person the power to perform miracles, and another the ability to prophesy. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God or from another Spirit. We call this the discernment, the gift of spiritual discernment. Still another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages, uh, We call that the gift of tongues, uh, while another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. And get this, it is the one and same spirit who distributes all these gifts. He alone decides which gift each person should have. In other words, he knows what you're going to need in any situation and he'll give. Sometimes he gives and you have a principal gift, but the thing is that if you've been given a gift of healing and somebody needs a word of knowledge, He's going to give it to you. So he alone gives as is required and knowing how you're wired and and knowing um, the the place that God has assigned you in terms of influence and and the Great Commission. You're familiar with many of these gifts. You know, faith is just simply, the gift of faith, for example, is just simply being able to um, believe in a greater capacity. It's to be able to believe for the impossible. And we need people like that. You know, if you have the gift of faith to believe for the impossible, trust me, you know, Kate and the team need you. Because as, as leaders, it's so easy to get bogged down and lose, lose a perspective of, of the big picture at times because you, you're busy trying to put this piece with that piece and fit everything together. And sometimes we need to be reminded Sometimes we need to be encouraged as leaders with that gift of faith. Hey, you're thinking too small. Don't limit God. And, and your gift of faith can encourage and inspire. If you're, in the, if you're in business, if you work in the business sphere, the gift of wisdom is an incredible tool for 
bringing the kingdom of God to bear. Because how many times have you sat around in a meeting and, and you've been brainstorming and you're at this impasse and no one can come up with a way forward? Uh, isn't it true that in these COVID times we're having to pivot all the time and people are just getting a little bit weary of trying to reinvent themselves? The gift of wisdom can break open all that. And what it does is you, you, you begin to speak from a perspective and, and with, a, with an insight that, that is greater than that of experience because God who knows all things is, is, is speaking through you. You say, well, how does that pull back the covers of darkness? Well, suddenly you've, you've demonstrated something that they've not experienced. You see, that they're, they're, they're hearing the voice of God through you. They're experiencing the power of, of, of God through you in a, in a, in a very gentle but, but nevertheless powerful way. And, and what's going to happen is suddenly they're going to look at you and think, you know, this person understands things we don't, sees things that we don't. And, and people are going to come to you and, and that's going to open up opportunity for you to, to be a witness to the grace and to the grandeur of God to point beyond what is to what can be. You know, Prophecy is, is, is something that we, that I understand why so many people pull away from that because it's true that in the church we've, we've abused this gift and, and, and much to my shame, you know, we, we've done it in ways which I think are very manipulative because I think we've misunderstood it. The gift of prophecy is, is really about speaking on behalf of God. If you read the prophets in, in the Old and the New Testament, they're calling people to account. They're calling people to righteousness. They are declaring the plans and purposes of God and saying, this is, this is what God requires. This is what God desires. This is, this is what God wants. And, God is, and so God is saying, this is the plan I have for you now. It's not automatic. You have to address this. You have to do that, whatever it is to be able to step into that. You know, I was um, praying for a couple recently who uh, had no child. And uh, I just felt the Lord say that, tell them that they will hold a child in a certain time frame if they would deal with this issue. Um, so I went and spoke with them and they had to deal with a particular issue. Uh, and if they dealt with this particular issue, they acknowledged the issue that existed, uh, they needed to deal with that issue. And in dealing with that issue, some other things came up, but long story short, they're expecting a child. Not because of me, but because of the, the power of God. The prophecy broke open, it pulled back and exposed some of the deception of the enemy so that it could be dealt with. And so that as that was dealt with, for, for reasons only known to God, they were able now to, to conceive and to have a long expected and a long loved child. You know, the word of knowledge, it's, you know, again, it's, it's something that we're, we're familiar with, but it's a great tool um, for, for breaking into, in, into the, 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 the kingdom of this world and, and, and bringing the power of God's kingdom to bear against the lies and the deception of the enemy. So often we've We've tended to keep it for Sundays and, you know, it's been exhortation and everything else. And I get that. I, I really do. But, you know, a word of knowledge is an incredibly powerful thing that God wants to give some of you. Even now, as, I, as I'm standing here, I, I just have the sense that some of you, uh, God, you've desired for more and you've been saying, God, is there more? And the answer is yes. He wants to give you words of knowledge that are going to change things. I believe that there's, there's, there's someone in particular who's, who even as I was sharing that testimony was stirred greatly. And I, and I just have this picture of you just like, just almost like as a funnel poured out to, pointed to heaven. God, I want that. The Holy Spirit is going to come and touch you powerfully right now and just begin to fill that. Not because of me, but because of your desire to be a witness to him and to, to live out of the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And, and tongues, when we talk about tongues, just quickly, you know, the Bible always talks about two types of tongues. There's the natural tongue, remember, at Pentecost, they could understand one another well. But there's also uh, the, the, the tongue of angels. Right after Paul finishes writing about spiritual gifts in chapter 12, he goes to chapter 13. Strange, isn't it? 12, 13, who would have thought? And look what he says, if I could speak in all the languages of earth, these are understanding every other language, and of angels, 
You see, this is the spiritual language that many of us are familiar with. And that, that, that connects us with heaven. It's, it's a language that connects us with, with God and all his, his grandeur. It's, it's, it's beyond words. It says, deep calls to deep, and it cries out. And, and it's a prayer language that allows us to, to connect in ways that our soul needs at times, and that, that refreshes us, that strengthens us. But at the same time, it can be that God communicates with us. And even though we may not understand the language, we're left with the strong sense of this is what I must do or this is what God wants me to say. So how do these quickly, how do these all come together? How do, how can, how do these work for the glory of God? And, and how do we uh, fit into all of that? Well, remember that the criteria is that the Holy Spirit gives as, as he determines you know, we can pray and we can desire, but, but ultimately he decides what we need, what tool is best for the situation in which we find ourselves. He, he knows what tools we need in our, uh, in our hand for, to use wherever it is that we've been assigned to minister God's grace in its various forms. So, so, so let me encourage you with, with, with these few thoughts about, about how to use these gifts. You know, I'm going to pray in a minute and, and just pray that God's going to fill you and God's going to release, release you. But, but it's one thing to receive them. It's another thing to work with them. And so let me just share from my experience um, the most effective way of using these tools. The first is quite simple. Um, pray. Just pray. You know, just pray. God, how would you have me minister into the situation. Lord, is there anybody you want me to speak to? Lord, is there anybody that you, and, and just keep praying. Lord, today as I go about my work, I want to be aware of your presence. I want to be aware of your, 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 your direction. I want to be in step with you. And, and, and pray in tongues. And, and what will happen is that, that as you develop that attitude of prayer and connection with God and the Holy Spirit's going to, to guide and direct you. I, I shared a couple of testimonies of, of, of words of knowledge, of, of, of prophecy, and um, they flowed out of just going for a walk. And as I walk, I pray, God, is there someone you want me to talk to? Is there, is there a situation you want me to speak into? Is there, is there something you just want me to pray about? And, and that just draws me, my mind and my, my thoughts away from everything that's happening around me. It draws them away from myself. It draws them away from what's happening in my life or, or anything like that. And just draws me to the throne room where I'm able to, without the distractions of, and the busyness of life, hear what the Spirit of God is saying so that I might act on it. Second thing is that you've got to make sure that your heart is right, that God, that your motivation is right. You know, in, in Romans chapter 15, Paul says, my ambition, his goal, his, his desires have always been to preach the good news where the name of Christ has never been heard rather than where a church has already been started by someone else. You see, his desire was never to go around and build a kingdom for himself. It was never to go around and become a big node. It was never to go around and draw attention to himself. It was always to preach the good news where the name of Christ had never been heard. Desire the gifts. Desire God to work through you. Desire the power of God to be, to, to be manifest in you. Desire to be, to, to be in the Spirit for the sake of God, for the sake of the gospel. Not for your sake. It's so easy to be tempted to, to turn the gifts inward, to use them for your sake. Well, this is going to open a door for me. People need me to pray, lay hands on them and pray for them to be healed. Good. They need me to give a word of knowledge. They need me. It's, it can never be about that. Because here's the thing. The moment we allow the enemy to, to corrupt our motives and to lead us away from, from, from making it about Jesus... What's going to happen is that, that the gifts are going to become corrupt. And, and yeah, God will, still, God will still flow through us in, in, in some measure. But the mixture between God and self becomes greater. And, and what happens is we end up doing damage to people's lives, doing damage to the kingdom of heaven, doing damage to the reputation of Jesus. And, and God is a jealous God. He's jealous for his reputation. He's jealous for your reputation. 
And so guard your heart because here's what I've found. In those times and those seasons in life where I've made it about me, I've found that I haven't flowed as naturally in the power of the Holy Spirit as I do at other times because it's about me, about drawing attention to me instead of deflecting attention away from me to the one who holds all things in the palm of his hand, to the creator of the heavens and the earth, the one in whom, whose image others are made. The other thing is, I think, if you're going to operate in the gifts of the Spirit, I want to encourage you to be bold. There's a difference between being bold and arrogant. Boldness is a confidence that it's no longer I that lives, but Christ who lives in me. It's a confidence that, you know what, God can do all things. It's a, it's a boldness that is not worried about self. It's trusting fully in God. So, so boldness is, is when I feel that God is saying, would you go into that shop? Would you go into that office? Am I upset? Am I anxious? You bet. Am I nervous? I'm an introvert by nature, but I'm bold. You know, I, I have this thing that, you know, if God says to do it, what have I got to lose except face in heaven? I would much rather lose face amongst my peers than lose face in heaven. I would much rather my, my peers be embarrassed by me, but, but people mock me than bring disappointment to the heart of my father. You've got to be bold. What's the worst that can happen? You know, you, we read his church history, we read the New Testament, and, and there was a boldness about those disciples. You need to be bold. Trust that God's going to work through. When you pray for healing, don't pray one of these little prayers, oh God, would you, could you, we know you want to. Just go and take authority. Believe that God is going to heal. It's up to him whether he does or not, not you. So pray with boldness. Pray with faith. God, I just thank you right now in Jesus' name that you are going to. And you declare, you, you have the faith to believe what is not yet will be in someone's life and you declare it and you pray with faith believing that the one who sits in heaven is hearing and responding even as you lay hands on that person and lastly humility cultivate humility as I say it can never be about yourself it can never be about yourself you know if you're anything like the rest of us during lockdowns we sh our patterns of um, shopping shifted from in person to online and maybe in that time you ordered something you, you was something you wanted something you, you treated yourself with and you ordered it online and it was shipped to you packaged up put in a box courier drops it on your doorstep describe right now in detail that courier driver chances are you can't even remember who it is you see, no one remembers the courier. They remember the package. You see, it's not about us. We're just the delivery mechanism. It's about the result. It's about the, bringing the kingdom of God to bear, to release hope, to release life, to release the power of heaven in a situation so that the, the lies of the enemy are, 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 are um, undone, so that the, the presence of God is manifest so that blind eyes are open, captives are set free, and Jesus is glorified. The, uh, here's my experience. The more humble someone is, it seems to me the more powerful their ministry is. It seems to me that the, the more humility a person possesses, the more powerful their ministry is. It shouldn't come as a surprise, but that, that's... That, that's, that's how it works in the economy of God. And so I just want to encourage you with those thoughts. You know, to be, to be used of God, to, to, to use the tools he gives us for his glory, to extend his kingdom, you know, that we should desire them and be motivated to want them. But to do that, we've got to, we've got to be bold. We've got to be humble. And we have to seek to constantly walk in the, in, in the power of the Holy Spirit. It has his presence has to become greater and our desire for him has to become greater than our desire for the things of this world, the comfort, the acceptance of this world. So I hope that encourages you. I, I, hope, that, and I hope that strengthens you. I hope that 
releases something in you. I just want to pray for you quickly at some, you know, I just feel a connection with you guys. As I say, I'm just so excited for what God wants to do. I, I, you know, I think you're about to start a new chapter as, 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 a, as, a, as, a, as, a, as a group of churches, as a movement. I, I think that God's got a, a new chapter for you. I, I think that... I really think that uh, Josh and Angie are not simply pioneers in terms of uh, opening up mission opportunities. I think they are pioneers of creating vision and that they, that, that they are, have released vision and, and into you guys and it's going to open up something new and exciting and, and, and what is will give way to what will be and, and as great as, as, as what has been is that you're going to look back and think, wow, that was nothing compared to what you're going to experience. So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm cheering you on from the sidelines. Trust me, I, I am a big fan of Divergence. So, so let me just quickly pray for you. Father, I just want to thank you for this time. and Thank you that we belong to one another uh, in your body. We are family. So as family, as as, as brother to brother, as brother to sister, Lord, I just pray right now, Holy Spirit, you'll come and do what only you can do in, in their lives. Holy Spirit, just would you fill and, and strengthen their lives in, in powerful ways. May it not be about a feeling, but Lord, not just about a momentary, a transitory experience, but Lord, something shifting. They feel something shifting. Lord God, they, they feel something changing inside of themselves as Holy Spirit, you come and touch them and release good gifts. I pray for boldness. I pray for humility. I, Lord, as you release healing, as you release words of knowledge, as you, as you release prophecy and words of wisdom, uh, discernment. Lord God, I thank you that, that you're going to release gifts even now. And that, Lord, you're going to be edified and glorified and people are going to be changed in Jesus' precious name. Well, thank you, church. I look forward to, to tracking with you and seeing what God uh, does as, as his plans for you unfold. Until I get to see you at some point, God bless.